Conceived in rape and given up for adoption at seven days old, Stephen Thin Holland has an incredible testimony that points to God's faithfulness and his redemption. He's going to tell us of his story of adoption, of finding out how he was conceived, how he was born, who his mother is, and oh my goodness, you are going to shed so many tears, happy tears and sad tears, but most of all, you are going to be encouraged as you are reminded of how good and how powerful God is. I'm so excited for you to hear Stephen Thin's story. Uh, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com, use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com, code Allie. Stephen Thin, thanks so much for taking the time yeah. to join us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, so I first saw your testimony um, in a live action Instagram post, and I thought, wow, this person, one, you're very compelling as you're sharing your testimony, but what an awesome story of God's redemption. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to bring you here to get the extended version of your testimony. So let's go back uh, to the beginning. Let's talk about it. And most people don't go all the way back to their conception when they're talking right. about their testimony, but you do. Yeah. Well, uh, it started as an eight-year-old little boy, you know, at school. I had some friends of mine make fun of me uh, because of my skin color. Hmm. And uh, what they said was, you're weird and different. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? And they said, well, you're the wrong color. And I uh, I looked at my hand and I started thinking about my family and I'm like, hey, they're they're white and I'm not. I'm brown. So I, I had this uh, moment like, what, you know, why would they say that? It kind of hurt yeah, uh, to be honest. But I come home and I'm sitting on the edge of the bed with my mom. So I've got some questions. Right. Like <laughs> I'm not the same as you. So uh, sitting on the edge of the bed with my mom that night as an eight year old little boy, I found out that I was actually adopted. Uh, but uh, seven days old, they brought me into their home as a foster child. I was on the same bottle of formula I left the hospital with. I was literally so weak that I couldn't suck a bottle. So this family, again, I always say that love goes deeper than color, deeper than DNA, uh, deeper than blood. Because um, I wasn't any of those things, you know, related to them, but they loved me the same. Uh, just they saw me as their son and they took me in and this family literally squeezed milk in my mouth to save my life. Um, I was very, you know, malnutrition, so my legs were drawn up into my body. Um, they, they literally would uh, take my legs and, and stretch them out, massage my legs. This family literally, literally saved my life. Mm -hmm. And why know? were you malnourished? Uh, because of, uh, well, we didn't know who my mom was at the time, like, yeah. yet. Um, there was some speculation that she might have some mental uh, challenges, mm -hmm. so I was not fed. Um, so I literally, again, seven days old, but I was on the bottle that I left the hospital with. So, um, you know, and I, and, um, so it, it's, it's crazy. They, um, they, they teased that when I was little, that I was like a little bulldog because my legs early on, because of that, uh, malnourishment, um, my yeah. leg, you know, I had, I walked bow legged, you know? Yeah. So <clears throat> I find that out at eight years old, right? Yeah. And that's all you know at that point. That's that, all I know. That your your adopted parents said, okay, yeah, this is why you look a little different than us. You're adopted. Exactly. Here's what it looked like when you first came mm -hmm. to us. But at that point, I'm guessing that's about all they told you. Yes. And uh, what, I, what I did get was I got eight pages of typewriter paperwork from 1982. So I was born on March 31st, 1982. At least that's the date they decided to go with. Yeah. There was even some speculation on that, right. you know, a few days. But I, I had... Um, I say it's a gift that I was receiving that I didn't know I was getting. Yeah. Uh, at the time, it was just a three-ring binder with eight pages of typewriter paperwork. Yeah. And it had my birth mom's name, Glenda Sue Holt, and then it had broken family history uh, mm -hmm. of her family that, that she had given human services when she dropped me off at seven days old. Okay. So once the family officially adopted me, they all those records came to them for me. So I'm receiving that as well at eight years old. So... And do you remember your reaction or your emotional response when you were eight and you learned that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, that's the first time in my life I ever remember being broken. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to think about that's the first time in my life I ever remember asking God why. Yeah. Like, why do I have to be the wrong color? That's what mm -hmm. those kids said at school, right? Yeah. Um, why do I? Why do I look different? Um, you know, why did my mom not give birth to me? 
And but the biggest why question was why would my mother, my birth mom, not want me? Mm. You know, um, that's a lot for an eight year old yeah. to think about. Yeah, and uh, it, so honestly, I was broken. You know, yeah. I, I cried a lot. I I was mad. I was frustrated. But at the same time, you know, confused because I knew I was loved in this family. You know, even though they're my adopted family, they lo- they've loved me so well. You know, it, it quickly, you know, the the pain quickly turned into like, okay, wait a minute. They love me. I'm in a safe place. You know, and it comes back to I, t- I tease when I speak, you know, nationally and publicly. I, I had a drug problem growing up. You know, I was drug in and drug out of every church service known to man. I don't know who can relate to that out there, but every time the church doors were open, I, you know, I was at church. Yeah. So my family, my mom's side of the family adopted side uh, had a gospel quartet and used to travel and sing. And uh, my grandmother, I call her Mimi. She was my Sunday school teacher. So I had literally had the word of, of God poured into my life and I knew of Jesus but in the middle of that little broken eight-year-old, uh, eight-year-old's heart, I actually came to know Christ in the middle of that pain and that brokenness at a church service. Uh, wow. Right? Yeah, tell me a little bit more about that. Uh, well, it was a revival. I don't know. We, yeah. you know, we still have, we call them revivals in the South. But yeah. uh, I grew up in the Tennessee, Chattanooga area, and uh, we were having a revival, uh, a weekly revival. And in the middle of that week, I just... Again, sitting sitting there with my family and, and hearing the goodness of God. And I've heard all my life. I don't remember what the sermon was. I don't remember really any of that other than I just needed Jesus. Yeah. And I'd heard my whole life that, you know, he's a comforter. He's a provider. He's a protector. He's a savior. And I, I, needed, I needed somebody to take that pain, you know. Yeah. So I came running in the middle of the service. I didn't wait for permission. I just came running. Uh, <laughs> We're Jesus. not even, we're barely five <laughs> minutes in. You're already making me cry. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I, you know, I'm big on, I think pain has purpose. Yeah. If, if we can look hard enough, you know, that, um, that's the kind of God we serve, right? Yeah. All right. Quick pause to tell you about our first sponsor for the day. And that is We Heart Nutrition. I absolutely love this company. They are uh, a wholesome company with only wholesome values and they also have wholesome ingredients in all of their supplements and multivitamins. They're the multivitamins that I take. They're super high quality and I love supporting a company that aligns with my values. I take their postnatal vitamins, their omega-3s, their iron, all that good stuff, and it really works for me. Also, I love that they're unapologetically pro-life. They donate 10% of every sale to pregnancy centers, and they have raised over $7,000 for Prestonwood Pregnancy Center. The director of that pregnancy center has been on this show before, so they are really saving lives, and they can improve your life too by giving you awesome supplements. Go to weheartnutrition.com. Use code Allie for 20% off your order. Weheartnutrition.com, code Allie. Tell me uh, when you learned the extent of um, your kind of conception story and who your biological mom was. Right. Well, I carried that why question for a long time, you know, so like for middle school, high school, I I tried to mask that in sports. So I was earthquake in middle school, freight train in high school. (laughs) I was a fullback, middle linebacker. You know, I I tried it, you know, to like you know that great uh quote that says you know uh Jesus plus nothing equals everything yeah but I was trying to put something Mm. you know like sports or relationships yeah so I uh I actually get to college uh make it make it I made it to college and yeah I uh I played baseball in college majored in youth ministry and uh, I think my my sole purpose in being in college was to find my wife. Mm. She was a volleyball player from Tampa, Florida. I married up. She's 5'11". I'm five. None of your business. Okay? <laughs> but uh, we we start dating. We start talking about what it would be like to have a family. Like, do we want to have kids? And how many do we want to have? And how early do we want to start? So we get married in Tampa, Florida, her hometown, in uh, June of 2006. And we start, you know, to have a family. We try to have a family early. So I was a youth pastor at this little church. My wife had gotten pregnant with our first, and eight weeks into the pregnancy, she wasn't feeling well. I went to church on a Sunday, and I came back to her 
um, just in the fetal position in our living room. She had had a miscarriage at home alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, here I find myself, my wife and I, asking God the same question that little eight-year-old boy was asking God, why? Mm -hmm. This pain, we didn't sign up for this. Yeah. And we just want to be parents, you know? So we, we lose our, our eight-week-old, our first pregnancy. Then we have... Uh, Isabella, who's our 16-year-old. I have three daughters, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, our oldest, Isabella, she's 16. And so we had her. And then our third pregnancy, 10 weeks in, uh, my wife just wasn't feeling well. She knew that motherly instinct, something's not right. So we went to the hospital or to the doctor. And uh, we had an ultrasound. We see a baby, but no heartbeat. So our third pregnancy, our 10-week-old, we lost as well. So now we've had two miscarriages. Now, I'm 41 years old, about to be 42. Um, I still don't know medical history, but so at 27 at this time, or the, when we lost our se uh, second baby, our, mm -hmm. our this uh, miscarriage, mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't know medical history. And I what the enemy started doing in me was, it's your fault. Hmm. Because if if you knew your past, right? If you, uh, maybe there's generational curses or I was just thinking all these things, right? And if I just knew the medical history, I could save my babies. Mm -hmm. So that's where my headspace was. But I'm a middle school pastor, Wednesday nights, 100 plus middle schoolers, you know, and trying to, I talk to pastors all the time that it's okay to hurt. Um, you know, I was young, you know, student pastor, and I, I thought I had to have it all together. So I didn't tell anybody. Yeah. So I'm depressed and I'm struggling and you felt like you couldn't be having a crisis of faith right. or you couldn't be questioning these right. things or asking God these questions because then right. people wouldn't think that you're qualified to be a pastor. So Absolutely. you bottled it up. Absolutely. And uh, and that's where I was. So in the middle of that, right, I go back to that little eight-year-old boy right in the middle of the pain. Here comes Jesus, you know. And I was sitting in a 975-square-foot apartment in Tampa, Florida. Uh, we had had these two miscarriages. We're actually pregnant with our four, the fourth pregnancy now, which is our 13-year-old daughter, Eliana, today. Wow. And then we had, I'll go ahead and say we have Cadence, our 10-year-old daughter. But So this is 2009. We've had those two miscarriages. My wife's pregnant with Eliana, our, our second daughter. And uh, the Holy Spirit just, just moved on my heart uh, in a way that I've never had happen since. And what I heard was, it's time. And I'm like, Lord, it's time for what? What's that mean? I need more. <laughs> And I went into praying and fasting, and he said, it's time to look for your mom. So mm -hmm. 27 years, right? I mean, from 8 years old to 27, you know how many times, like, I thought about seeking her out? Yeah. You know, like, where is she at? Would she care? Does she yeah, want me? Would she like to know me? And it just the timing was never right. Mm -hmm. Like, I would get this close, you know, and I had I had permission and, and um you know, just support from my adopted family if I ever wanted to do that, which is a huge thing. You know, I wanted to honor them. And so I called them and asked them, I said, I, is it okay to look? And they gave me their blessing. So I had that eight pages of typewriter paperwork from 1982, and I had Google. <laughs> so I start searching. And three days into the search, uh, I was doing name searches. I came across this man named Steve Holt, a website. He's a magician and ventriloquist from Spartanburg, South Carolina. And I know you don't know me, Allie, but I don't like clowns. I don't like <laughs> Chucky, It. I don't like any of that stuff. Okay. So, I mean, this guy's, like, got videos of him, like, sawing bodies in half and, you know, head on this side. You're and like, let, oh, heck no. I, I'm like, not today, Satan. You know, I'm not going on this man's website. <laughs> yeah. And really the puppets get me, though. Like, those wood, you know, their and eyeballs move. They're, they're, I they get are. it, yeah. You know, I don't. So, anyways, I got past that because something said click on his bio. And I clicked on his bio, mm -hmm. and literally I'm looking at my paperwork from 1982, and it all matches. It all lines up. And one specific name, it says my baby sister on his online for him, and it says Glenda Sue Holt, and that's my birth mom's name. So wow. I'm like, okay, the, you know, it's got to be family. Yeah. You know, this, this is my uncle. So I sent him an email, <clears throat> and it said, hey, I think I'm your long-lost nephew. And that's why I gave him because, you know, he could be a serial killer or, you know, I, I don't yeah. know. You, know, you didn't uh, want to tell him. No, yeah. I did not want to tell him anything. But he emails me back. And then about two months later, I jump on a plane, fly to Spartanburg, South Carolina, and I get to meet my birth uncle. What did he, what did he say <sighs> in his response? Do you remember? Um, well, I know that his wife, uh, my Aunt Vicky, said that he reads this email and literally falls out of his chair. 
Wow. You know, and and but he he writes me back and just says, you know, I think uh, I think this is legitimate. You know, I think that you are my nephew. Uh, I would love to meet you. You know, things like that. It, it was actually a very good response. Yeah. Uh, positive. That's good. So I felt, you know, the, uh, good about flying up and meeting him. So we spend two days. <clears throat> you know, I'm standing. I mean, we meet and I'm in his living room. And you talk about two grown men just hugging and weeping. and Because what he told me was, is in their family dynamic, there were uh, six children. So he was one of six. Their parents had died at an early age, and his five, the five siblings that he has, they were all mentally handicapped uh, in different ways. Like, wow. um, so he has a brother uh, that literally has been was institutionalized from 18 months old. Wow. Um, you know, to my mom being an 11 functioning as an 11 year old mentally. So, and he was the only one out of the six that was considered normal. Was he the oldest? Um, I, I actually, I, I don't remember where he, where falls, he falls in the story. I know yeah. my mom was the youngest, Okay. um, but he, but he basically, he cared for them because yeah. mom and dad died. They were all wow. thrown into orphanages. Wow. Um, and sadly, you know, I'm and a big, this was what in the oof. 60s, 70s. I'm, I'm yeah. Guessing. Yeah. Cause I was born in 82 and, and, uh, and she was actually 18. Okay. So, yeah, so 60s. Yeah. Yeah. Late 60s, 70s. So just, I'm a big advocate for foster care and adoption. You know, uh, that's my story, but these children, because of nobody wanted them, yeah. you know, so they were, they were in orphanages literally, you know, for most of their adolescent years until they aged out of the system. Um, my mom at 18, when she aged out, she became a ward of the state of Georgia. So this near the Atlanta area. Because she had special needs, and so Correct. it's not like she could just go to college or get a job. Exactly. Yeah. So no, no parents, you know, no family to care for for her. So the state took over, and uh, they placed her in a mental institution. And uh, one evening, um, it was we don't believe it was workers. She they they set her up with kind of a work program because she could function, some you know to work like to safely walk a short distance, like potentially work you know, kind of like a little job that she could have some independence. Uh, but one evening on her way home, she was actually raped by five men. Wow. Um, so she they, was just attacked in a random yeah. attack. She didn't, no. as far as you know, she didn't know these people. No. Um, so we don't know who, we still to this day don't know who, who the men were. Wow. Um, but so again, think about she's 18 f physically, but mentally she's only a child. Yeah. So Ugh. does she even so know what crazy. happened to her? You know, has anything ever, you know, has she been exposed to anything like that? I don't, we didn't, we don't know. And how did you, so I guess your uncle somehow learned of right. everything that happened. Right. That's how you know. Well, they found out, they, the, obviously she, she didn't tell anybody yeah, that it she happened. she probably couldn't really right. articulate that. And so when they do find, they find out, the staff find out that she's pregnant because she's showing you know, uh, that's how long, you know, it took for people to find this out. Gosh. So, I mean, the, you know, she tells the story. So, I mean, it's her account, you know, of what happened to her. Yeah. Um, Just as she was attacked by five exactly. men when she was walking right. home. Oh, so, gosh. so this is a state ran facility. Yeah. Um, she has no resources, no job, no money. Um, so what do, you, what do you think that they're telling her to do? You know? To have an abortion, I'm sure, that they're yeah. trying to pressure her to do right. that. They're not giving her options. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. uh, they're literally pressuring her every day to get rid of her baby. And, I mean, <laughs> she's amazing. You know, she said, even with an 11-year-old mental capacity, 18 years old, she said, my, my baby's worth fighting for. Yeah. So, so to fight for me and save my life, she actually ran away. <laughs> From the yeah. facility, I don't, I don't. We don't know how she escaped. Yeah. Um, but uh, the last time my uncle uh, had had, I guess, seen me, he didn't really see me. But I was in the womb. He, she actually came to him for help, and uh, he cared for for she and I for about a week. Yeah. Until she disappeared for ten years, so he didn't know what happened from 1982 to 1992. He reconnected with her, so he never knew what happened to the baby. And here I am. 27 year old man standing in his living room so he did meet you when you were a baby so i mean in the, in the womb in, I, in the womb yeah okay, yeah right. so not you know he didn't meet me meet me but i was in his presence right yeah. <laughs> wow and so i mean 
I don't know how else to explain that beyond just the Holy Spirit convicted right. her because that's what God can do. He can communicate to and through anyone. Right. Just convicted her to fight for you mm -hmm. and to fight for your life when really you would think with an 11 year old, you know, mental capacity that she would have just complied with what the people right. told her to do. But she knew Absolutely. that I'm going to fight for my baby. And so she ran, she ran away. Do you know, like, how she gave birth to you? Did she run to a hospital? Do you know how that worked? Well, <clears throat> we know that she made it to a women's shelter in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which, wow. which from where things happened, it was about two hours. Yeah, so was she in Atlanta? She was in the Atlanta area, area. Okay. Uh, like like Rome, yeah. Georgia mm -hmm. area. Yep. Um, so she made it to Chattanooga, was there for a, a little while. They cared for her. We just know from uh, paperwork trail but then by the end of the pregnancy, she's nine months pregnant and she's living on the streets. So she's actually in a cardboard box behind this little grocery store in this little small town called Whitwell, Tennessee. And it's if the people, if you're from there, they say Whitwell. -Wh. So it's yeah. a mining town like <laughs> yeah. Chattanooga's, you know, over here, there's a mountain, then Whitwell's in the valley. Yeah. So it's it's literally tucked in two mountains. Yeah. And she's living in this box behind this store and a 16 year old boy named Bobby came around the, skipping school, came around the back of this store and sees the box move, pulls it back. And here she is, 18 years old, nine months pregnant. He takes her home to his family, like walks her home and walks in the door. You know, 16 years old, walks in the door with an 18 year old, nine month pregnant woman. And it's like, hey, I found her in this box behind the store. Can we keep her? Right. <laughs> and that, you know, to me as a parent, you know, a parent, a 16 year old young man walks in with an 18 year old nine month pregnant woman. It's like, I got some questions uh, here. Yeah, there's right. But no, I just found her. Can yeah. we keep her? And they took us in, uh, cared for us for like two weeks. Wow. And then she gave birth to me in, uh, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, at Erlinger yeah. Hospital. Wow. Uh, they said on March 31st, 1982. And so everybody always like, who, who, you know, how did you get the name Steventhon? Right. Well, this mentally challenged 18-year-old woman, 11-year-old capacity, said, I want my son to be named Stephen, then William. Oh. So Stephen was her brother, my uncle, who I'm standing in his living room. Yeah. And William was her dad, my grandfather. So she wanted me to have both names. So what we, what we think, you know, she probably didn't speak very well, articulate yeah. very well. So they're asking her, like, what? You know, you want to name him what? Stephen, then William. Stephen, yeah. then William. So whoever heard it put S-T-E-V-E-N-T-H-E-N. Stephenton is my first name. Oh, so my goodness. As I think I'm the only one in the world that we know of right now with that yeah. name. Okay, another break for good ranchers. Okay, maybe your New Year's resolution is just starting on February 1st, January 1, it, or January, it was just, it was a wash. You didn't get to those New Year's resolutions that you wanted to. Good ranchers can help you eat healthy in the new year because you've got one part of every meal already taken care of. You've got your better than organic chicken. You've got your different cuts of steak. You've got your ground beef. You've also got your bacon. You can ensure that you are eating enough protein all from American farms and ranches if you subscribe to Good Ranchers. And if you subscribe, they will also send you over two pounds of chicken for free. It's a great deal going on. If you use code Alley, you will also save $20 on your order. So go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Alley at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Alley. So I'm finding all this out at 27, standing in his living room. Yeah. But then. That's a lot. But, yeah, but wow. it's not over yet. Yeah. I'm standing there and it kind of got awkward. It got quiet. He, um, I thought I said something wrong, you know. And he, he just says, you know, I had to meet you and look you in the eyes and see what kind of man you were before I told you this, but your mom is alive. She's five hours south of where we stand. Yeah. And he asked me one question. He said, do you want to meet her? Yeah. And what the Holy Spirit had spoke to me a couple months before I got to fly up there was it's time. Mm. So we jump in a car the next day. I wanted to go that night. Yeah, you know, of course. Let's, let's go. Um, but we drove five hours south to a little town called Jeffersonville, Georgia, where my mom was staying in another mental institution, like a nursing home. Okay. Had men on one side, women on the other. And my uncle was like, hey, let's do a magic show. I'm going to do a show for the residents because that way, because again, I mean, I'm 27, she's 46, but she's still only 11. 
yeah. mentally. Right. So you're about to meet, you yeah. know, we're about to drop a bomb in her life. You right. know, 27-year-old, <laughs> hey, here I am. And that's um, like such a tough dynamic for you to right. be in some way older than your mother. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I got to spend two hours just interacting with her. Like she didn't know who I was, but I knew who what she was. What was it like when you saw her for the uh, first time? It was like trying uh, to hold back a flood, you know, 27 years of tears. Well, eight, you know, whatever the yeah. math is, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, just trying to hold back just thankfulness. Um, yeah. because I, all I needed, I mean, my God's faithful. He's good. Yeah. I know my identity and my worth is, I didn't have to meet her, you know? But for me to have the opportunity to meet her, I just wanted to tell her I loved her and thank you for giving me life. And if I, if that's all I got, I was okay with that. Yeah. So, you know, it was I was dying to just tell her, you know, but we were trying to ease it in. Like, I, I'm your I'm your brother's friend, Stephen. You know, we, did, we didn't, uh, you know, give the full name because she named me that. We didn't want to give it away. So anyways, he does this magic show. And I mean, you know, these people are like schizophrenics and – you know, bipolar, and he's saw it putting ropes through people's bodies, and it was really. I'm, I'm just. I gotta set the scene because, you know, it was There's very. A lot com- going on it was in this very moment. Comical. Yeah, but you know, it's not the scene that maybe like uh, Hollywood would have painted exactly. for this like grand reunion. Exactly. There's like this crazy magic show, mm-hmm. and these residents who. Right. have got a lot going on themselves, and, and in the midst of all of that, you're seeing your mother for the first time. Right. And so we were going to go to her room and do this private encounter uh, because we didn't know how she would take it. Yeah. But she had been singing songs all day. And I'm a singer, worship leader, um, singer, songwriter. And um, they, he gets through the magic show. I'm working a camera. Like, we hadn't planned to film it. But we were just kind of filming his magic show just to kind of capture the moments. And she gets through singing, and I just felt led to come sing Amazing Grace. And I come up, and the camera's still rolling, and my uncle's standing in between us. And I start singing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved. And when I hit that word saved, it was like not just a salvation, you know, moment, but a this woman I'm looking at in the eyes saved my life, and I lost it. And she hasn't sang on pitch or key all day long, and she looks at me, and she just finishes the whole verse, like, perfectly. And uh, just and and this is a you know this is on YouTube. We have a video that people can. Uh, I, we decided to make it public uh, a few years ago, just for you know it's just too good for God's faithfulness, His goodness, yeah, you know, not to, not to hold on to. It's testimony. Mm-hmm. So I'm getting to meet. Uh, you know, he he in that moment after we did that, he was like, we 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 weren't going to do it this way, but basically, here's your son, you know, and she just embraced me and said that she loved me and she would have never given me up if she could have kept me and. Those are all those questions I had. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't have to have them, but God gave me a lot of closure that I didn't even know I needed. Yeah. You know? So she had the ability to have a conversation with you about she it. She did. She did. And, um, you know, I am worth it. And she did love me, you know. And, again, I knew that, but that was closure. I didn't even realize that I needed When she said that, it was healing for yeah. me. Um, and then... I had also made her a photo album that was really special to me. It was yeah. the first picture they ever had of me, and to, you know, and I filled it up with pictures over the years because she held on to a picture for like 18 years that wasn't her, wasn't me, that she thought was her baby. So I was able to bless her with this photo album, and wow. um, so we had 11 years with Mama Glenda. Uh, my girls call her Gigi, Grandma Glenda. So you talk about like the age difference. My girls would bring coloring books and um baby dolls and play with my mom yeah you know they were like sisters when they get together you know like coloring yeah, or playing sweet. Uh, but even though that was beautiful it was also painful because uh she's a ward of the state they would move her from you know whatever the cheapest place was kind of under you know sadly they're understaffed over medicated and um but she even with all that and even though it was hard on my girls we took them at least once a year sometimes twice. It was hard on them to be in those places, but my mom deserved respect. Yeah. She deserved to be loved on. And, um, so that was, what, 2009, 2010? That this it was happened? 2009 when we met. Okay. Um, so then she, uh, she actually passed away on Thanksgiving of 2020. Mm-hmm. She choked on a sandwich 
uh, in the facility that she was in. What? So, yeah, she was in a wheelchair, and, you know, they. it's something that obviously they – you know, uh, so he, it sorry. was very just a tragic, tragic accident. But um, you know, here I am asking God why again, right? Yeah. Um, but um, you know, this beauty that comes out of pain. By that time, I had been sharing our story quite a bit, and probably two hundred thousand people or so I've shared. You know, just doing a lot of pregnancy center fundraisers yes. and and uh, right to life events, pro life events, and when it hit social media, you know, shared about her, her death, I started getting floods of messages. Hey, she's not just your hero. Cause I, she, I call her my hero. She's mine too. And, uh, so I have this beautiful, um, mandate calling to carry on her legacy because she is a hero. Right. Yeah. She fought for me. Yeah. And, uh, I'm thankful for that. All right, let me tell you about Jace Medical. You just want to make sure that your family is prepared should anything happen. Say you can't get the medications that you need through your doctor and pharmacy, but you still need those prescriptions that you and your family rely on, or maybe you need an antibiotic because someone in your family has an infection. You need a year-long supply of those medications at your disposal should you need them, should things really hit the fan in our country or whatever happens, you're not able to get access to those medications. Just go ahead make sure that you're prepared that you have those daily uh, prescriptions and also that you have uh, those antibiotics that's what jace medical does for you through their telemedicine process they make sure that you have all of those medications a year-long supply should you need them go to jacemedical.com use code ally at checkout for a discount on your order that's jacemedical.com code ally and and what do you think when you hear these conversations and debates that go on in the political realm on social media mm -hmm. uh, when you hear, well, the compact, like the, you're basically what they say is the uh, exception. Even if someone is pro-life, they'll say, well, right. but if they heard of the case of your mom, mm -hmm. they would say the empathetic thing to do, the compassionate thing to do would be absolutely to make sure that she gets an abortion. Right. They would say, sure, maybe I'm pro-life, but rape, incest, if the mother, you know, has special needs, then we should kill that child. Yeah. That's kind of the narrative that you hear sometimes right. on the left and the right. I imagine right. just being who you are and having your testimony, it's hard to hear those conversations in that mm -hmm. tone. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to not take it personal. Yeah. You know, we I can sit here and say, well, you know, I don't take it. Well, it 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 kind of is, you know. Yeah. Um I'm a um I'm a lover of people. I'm a, I'm if that makes sense, uh yeah. I, what I'm trying to say there. Of I course. I try um I'm going to respect your position and where you stand, but that still doesn't mean that I can't have a voice. Um and I I think that for me, uh, the way I fight that is I share my story. Right? Like I I'm here um, I believe I have purpose. I have worth. That wasn't dictated by how I was conceived, right? And and the uh, and it, I think we say, you know, in the exception world, it's it's you know the sins of the father shouldn't be passed on to the onto the child, you know. Um, and and I I used to, Ali, I used to say, um, man, I wish that would have never happened to my mom. You know, like if I could trade places with her, I mean, you know, I don't I don't want her to have to go through that. I mean, that was horrible and terrible. Yes. But then there's this other side I had to think about, like, but God had this, you know, God worked in the middle of all that pain and all that brokenness to bring me. Yeah. <laughs> and I have three beautiful daughters, you know, that are 16, 13, and 10. They love Jesus, and they lead worship, and they write songs. Um, yeah. What Satan means for evil, yeah. God uses for yeah. good. And I just, I love that verse so much. I mean, when you think about but the story that that verse is in, that Joseph, think about, I, it's hard to think about things more tragic than one, what your mom went through, mm -hmm. but also the story of Joseph. I mean, imagine being sold into slavery by your own brothers. You're mm -hmm. the youngest of the family right. and your brothers take you, they throw you into a pit. So you get sold yeah. into slavery. Mm -hmm. Like what is mm -hmm. more evil and more wicked right. than that? He's sold into slavery and then God uses that evil, that wickedness to save his own people from famine. Right. Wow. And I just think of 
I, I think of that when I think of your story, mm -hmm. that what was so evil, a woman being raped, a special needs woman mm -hmm. being raped, that God used that evil to then multiply his kingdom right. so that you can sit here, share your testimony, testify to the power and the right. love and the grace and the redemption of the Lord, and your daughters get to do the same right. thing. Wow, right. God is so good. Well, and I, and I look at, I mean, there's been moments where I've been able to share at a fundraising event and I had a table, a small group of women at their church that was struggling with that, you know, the exception, you know, rape and incest. And like they kind of came with, hey, we're here. We, we lean towards the other, you know, the other side uh, of in agreement with rape and, you know, making the exception. And then after, you know, I got to share my story We're we're, you know, they're surrounding me. We're all crying. <laughs> and it's like you you've changed our hearts. You yeah. know, you change our minds like we we can't sit here. You don't hear your story and not be moved. And we have to rethink the position. And I, God's given me that's just one. But yeah. so, many so many conversations. Um, and for me, uh, it's just being faithful to share the story um, and let God handle the rest. But totally. I, I had a 12 year old Hispanic young girl that had actually been raped by her uncle <sighs> and had actually heard me share my story at a. I was I was there to lead worship at a camp, and I wasn't even supposed to share my story, but God opened the door for me to share, and she actually went against the wishes of her parents to choose life. Mm. So she got removed from the home. She gave birth to her baby. Mm. I was leading worship at a church, and this family came and placed that baby in my arms. Wow. Talk about losing it. <laughs> yeah. And then this young woman got adopted by another family, another church family, the, the, the little girl. So I got to meet her at 13 and she's crying and she says, how do I know that my son going to know that I love him because I gave him away and I'm, I'm trying to get the words out. I'm crying. I said, you're one of the strongest women on the planet, Totally. you know, to give birth to your child, give your child a loving home, right? You loved him so much that you, you wanted to place him in a place that he could be loved well and provided for. He know he knows, and one day I hope maybe that he'll have the chance like I did, you know, to look my mom in the eyes, hug her, and tell her I love her. Thank you for giving me life. So I just again, those are just those little moments where I call you know nuggets. Uh, yes. God winks. It's like hey, you know, this is part of your purpose. I truly yeah. believe that's part of my purpose is to continue to share my story. Yeah. Right? And I know that this is it's painful. But because all of us have this, I think, just natural drive to know whose we are, where we come from, even just physically, obviously, mm -hmm. we know that we're gods. But have you ever wondered, like, who your who your father is and what happened to those men yeah. who assaulted your mom? Yeah. I've um, I've had moments where I, I've thought thought about that. Um even recently, I've had people ask me, you know, do you not want justice for your mom? And they've come out and asked that. And it's not that I don't want justice for my mom, but I don't, I go by the direction of the Lord, you know, and I haven't felt in my heart that he's, you know, called me to seek that out, to try to find, um, I'm not saying that it won't happen one day, but right now I feel like he's redeemed and restored all the evil by what, you know, with my mom's life and what I'm able to do and carry on her legacy by sharing our story. Mm. Um, I've even had somebody, I mean, we're, we're being honest here. I've had somebody ask me like, you know, well, what if he's not a believer, you know, this person, and if you could find them, right. I, so I'm wrestling with that. Yeah. I'm wrestling with that right now, you know, on, um, cause I hadn't thought, I hadn't thought about it in mm -hmm. that way before. You know, I, I put my focus more on my mom. Yeah, which you know, makes sense. And our story, and and uh, and honoring her. Um, I don't hate my I don't hate my dad, uh, my father, my birth father. I don't hate those men. Um, I had to let go of that a long time ago. You know, yeah. I think that those bitterness and you know hold root and and uh, can keep us you know uh, held in chains. I guess is the best way. I don't want that. I don't think that's what God wants. Mm. Uh, but, but two, I think one of the biggest reasons that I've never really, I've thought about it, but it hasn't been a deep longing pursuit to find my fathers because I had one of the best fathers, uh, earthly fathers that I could have had. Um, my dad, I've got a picture in my book on page 36 that I, that's a treasure to me. He was a coal miner. I thought he was black most of my life, but he was not, he was white because <laughs> he would come in covered in coal and he would clean himself and he would sleep shirtless. 
And from the first day they brought me home, he would hold me on his chest and yeah. sleep with me uh, heart to heart. Mm -hmm. And I have that. It's a treasure because uh, he, he died of Alzheimer's. He passed away mm -hmm. on, on August uh, 19th of 2014. And mm -hmm. I got to hold him on his way out like he held me on my way in. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. Huh. So, oh, uh, my goodness. I mean, he was a hard nosed country man. You know, when they tried to remove me, actually, at six months old, the state of Tennessee tried to remove me from the home because of my, my skin color. Um, so, being a biracial child in the South, they felt like I would be better placed in a biracial home, mixed oh, wow. race home, or, or an African American home. Oh, wow. And my dad put a shotgun by the back door or the front door and said, you can come in, but you're not taking my son. I'm not saying that's the best way to handle it <laughs> that's legally. That's just what happened. But Tennessee coal miner. He's my dad. Yeah. And uh, he loved me and fought for me. And and did you have adopted siblings? Like I did. I did. Not I'm adopted, but adoptive siblings, right. I guess. So what's it's beautiful. I've been an uncle since I was two. Wow. So I have four. Uh, I have four siblings. Adopt my adopted siblings. I have which is, this is hilarious to me. I have Ricky, Rod, Renee, and Robin, and then there's Steventon. Yeah. And you would have thought, you know, eight years of, like, why is my name different? Like, yeah. I just never, Yeah. they just love me, you know? Yeah. Um, and I've always been a part of the family, and um, I teared up, yes, actually flying here uh, to do the show, like talking to my mom and my sister yeah. on a call, just thanking them yeah. for just loving me, you know? And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. You know, uh, so yeah, Ricky, Rod, Renee, and Robin, and I—it's a thirteen-year age gap. Yeah. Our, well, there's so much in your story that flies against, uh, flies in the face of common narratives of today that, uh, you know, a Southern Tennessee white coal mining family mm -hmm. took in a little biracial boy, and you having to deal with everything that came with yep. being biracial in the South and mm -hmm. this time and being bullied because of that. Gosh, there's just a lot of complexity and a lot of layers to your story. Well, I think a really beautiful thing too for me is I still to this day, so when the state tried to remove me from the home, um, not only did my family fight for me, but I have uh, a folder, a manila uh, envelope that has about 200 and over 250 petition letters that this community um, which racism still existed, you know, and it was 82, um, was prevalent there. And they still rallied behind this family to keep this biracial child in the home. Like if it wouldn't have been for them, you know, their voice and them writing letters into the state. And it even went over beyond state lines, actually, some of the letters. But uh, yeah. that just... I think that's, again, like when I get an opportunity to share at fundraising events and things like that, I, I share that because yeah. this community decided, you know, Sarahman Burke says the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Yeah. And um, so let's do something, right? Yeah. And, and the uh, love of Christ transcends yes. transcends skin yeah. color, transcends absolutely norms. And it also just goes to show that history in the world isn't, as figuratively and literally black and white as mm -hmm. we kind of make it out to be that, okay, mm -hmm. everyone in the South that was white was racist or whatever it is mm -hmm. in either direction, like human beings, history, uh, the history of a country, the history of us as people, the history of the church, it's complicated. There are a yes. lot of layers and the through line is God's faithfulness. Mm -hmm. And I think that your story is such a great example of that. Last sponsor for the day is My Patriot Supply. So as we just talked about with Jace Medical, you never know what's going to happen. Hopefully you'll never need to tap into an emergency food supply. But if you do, it would be better, right, for you to have uh, those emergency food kits. So go ahead, go to preparewithally.com, get a three-month emergency food supply kit for every member of your family. You'll get delicious meals you and your family will be taken care of for those three months it's just again it's better to be safe than sorry with these kinds of things go to preparewithally.com when you do you'll get a 200 dollars discount on your order that's a great deal go to preparewithally.com that's preparewithally.com is there any just kind of like final message that you would speak to someone who is either in your situation or or who has an unexpected pregnancy or just wants to know the gospel, what would you say? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, for us, um, 
universal message is that you're not alone, mm. right? Um, you know, whether you're someone who's struggling to know your purpose and, you know, whether there's a God or does he love me? Does he care about me? You're, you're never alone. I love uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9. It talks about how, you know, we're hard pressed, we're crushed and all those things. But my favorite one is, you know, you're, you were never abandoned. You were never alone. You may, you know, you're uh, in struck down, but not destroyed. Not yeah. yet. Um, I say broken, not dead. That's yeah. uh, that's how I live. But I think um, that you're never, you're not alone. So if you're, if you're someone who's, um, you know, an unexpected pregnancy and looking for help, there's beautiful organizations that I've been blessed. I've been in 39 states now, you know, and I know that, um, you know, every single one of those places I've been in is non-judgmental. You know, they love you, support yes. you. They have resources, you know, so just to know that there is help and there is support um, to look for your local Pregnancy Resource Center, I think, would be a great place, but also to the church, you know, like for the gospel. Like when my mom died, I was struggling with why did she have to die alone? And God quickly reminded me, you know, after a week or so of uh, grieving and crying and asking God why, uh, she was never alone. Hmm. You know, so we, I think that's, I think for me, that's, I think a lot of people, if we can just realize that God does have a plan for your life, He's created you for a purpose you know, on purpose, with purpose, and uh, and he's there, you know, and he truly loves you. And Amen. There's people like me that, uh, you know, if I can help in any way, I mean, there's a lot of us out there in, in the faith-based world. That, and know, where can people me. find you if they want to connect well, with you? The beautiful thing is, Ali, but I'm the only Steventon in the world, <laughs> so uh, I don't have to worry about SEO or anything yeah. like too much. You're just right there. Uh, but steventon.com, okay. uh, so St- Steventon Holland is my last name. So if you Google me, um, you know, videos and, and I'm again, I'm a singer songwriter. So I've got about 22 songs I've recorded. I'm recording awesome. in Nashville in February. Good. Um, and then uh, my nonprofit, Broken Not Dead Ministries. Yeah. So BrokenNotDead.com okay. is also a Great. good place to track me down. Well, Stephen, then thank you so much for taking the thank time you. to share your testimony and may God bless you and your sweet girls and your yeah. family. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia.